Welcome, thank you all for joining us here at the Blue Coat. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Jane Marie Collins, who will speak about her latest publication with Liverpool University Press. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mary Booth. I'm the program manager for the Center for the Study of International Slavery. So tonight, Dr. Collins will discuss her book, Emancipatory Narratives and Enslaved Motherhood, which will be available for purchase following her presentation by our friends at LUP. Uh, additionally, if you have any projects you'd like to discuss or you want to browse a selection of books in the series, see Ali after the presentation at the table. So this book examines three currents in the historiography of Brazilian slavery. <coughs> manumission, miscegenation, and creolization. It revisits themes central to the history of slavery and race relations in Brazil. It updates the research about them and revises interpretations of the role of gender and reproduction within them. First, about the preponderance of women and children in manumission. Second, about the association of black female mobility with intimate interracial relations. Third, about the racialized and gendered roots to free status. And fourth, about the legacies of West African female socioeconomic behaviors from modalities of family and freedom in the 19th century in Salvador de Bahia, Brazil. Now, Dr. Collins has been a lecturer in Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American studies in the now Department of Modern Languages at the University of Nottingham since 1998. She has taught the histories and cultures of the Lusophay world since then, but her main teaching areas are now Brazilian history and literature. In terms of research and publications, her key research area is slavery in 19th century Bahia, but she has also worked on other themes in 19th and 20th century Brazilian history and culture, including infanticide, race relations, abolitionist literature, and military rule and historical memory in Brazil. She is the current editor of the Academic Journal of Portuguese Studies. So without further ado, I would like to present Dr. Jane Marie Thomas. Thank you for taking the time to come along and listen to me today. I know there's lots of things going on in Liverpool. So um, I'm very grateful for you dedicating your time to come here. Uh, thanks are also due to some people who aren't here for making the book and this event possible. The staff at Liverpool University Press, although one of them is here, Ali Lee, I can't thank him enough. I've already thanked him in person, but I'm going to make a public thank you now. And to all the staff at Liverpool University Press and <coughs> Ali Publishing for their support from start to finish. Thanks also due to staff at the Centre for Study of International Slavery at the Liverpool University, University, especially Mary Booth who's here now, for organising the event. It's a genuine honour, albeit a rather daunting one, to be here today to talk about what feels like a lifetime's work in 45 minutes, during which I hope I can do justice to the subject as much as the book itself. This talk is, by definition, about an academic book, but as this is a public presentation, I've tried to keep academic references to a minimum, and I've avoided entering into any in-depth discussions of academic debates, but if anybody wants to ask about that in more detail in this regard, please do feel free to ask me in the Q&A at the end. So Emancipatory Narratives and Enslaved Motherhood by Ian Brazil covers a complex subject in a time and place a long way from here, although neither slavery nor Brazil are totally unconnected from the history of Liverpool, a port city of a slave trading nation at the edge of the Atlantic world. So by way of introduction to the book and to help us all navigate that journey from here to there, I'll start by explaining how I started out on this project, followed by some samples of historical evidence about enslaved motherhood and what emancipatory means, emancipatory narratives means as an approach, and some historical context to the subject and themes addressed in emancipatory narratives. And finally, an overview of the contents and main points of argument made in the book. Starting out with how I ended up in my year, it was as an undergraduate student at what was then the Institute of Latin American Studies at the University of Liverpool, and I was especially interested in social banditry in my year, and particularly uh, this figure, Vergolino um, Ferreira da Silva, otherwise known as Lampiel, depicted on the left by the winning group in this year's Samba School Parade in Rio de Janeiro's Carnival. But I ended up being guided to and through the archives by a professor of history at the Universidade Federal de Bahia, Joel José Fez, an author at that time of two studies of Brazilian slave society, um, Death is a Festival and Slave Rebellion in Brazil, although I don't think either of them had been translated into English at the time. Indeed, at the time, in the mid-1990s, the history of slavery in Brazil was not well understood at all outside of Brazil, with very few publications in English 
Even in Brazil, the history of slavery was not taught in schools, and research into, into it was the preserve of a few scholars and PG students at a handful of universities. I was fortunate to work with one of those scholars and at one of those universities, and one of the growth areas of the scholarship at the time was manumission, and by extension the lives of free people, and especially Africans, not least of all because the documentation relating to this area and this group of people was comparatively speaking plentiful, in reasonable condition and accessible if you knew the archive well enough. And from looking at a very narrow set of documents for my undergraduate dissertation, mainly labour contracts for hired out slaves as a route to manumission, I then branched out in my PhD to explore gender and slave resistance more broadly. When it came to publishing the thesis, the focus on enslaved motherhood was a result of conclusions I reached about the shortcomings of the PhD rather than conclusions I'd arrived at in it, namely that the ways enslaved women resisted their enslavement and strategised for freedom was shaped by experiences of enslaved motherhood. But the historical significance of these gender-specific imperatives could not be accounted for using thinking tools and approaches from the field of slave resistance studies alone. In sum, emancipatory narratives is the result of decades spent scrutinising sorry, scrutinising the archival documents pertaining to the lives of African women and their descendants in slavery and in freedom, and for the most part, asking the same questions about how they navigated between one condition to the other, why they failed and how they succeeded. For some insights into the kind of evidence that prompted this focus on enslaved motherhood, I'll start off with two examples from the first part of the book, the freedom suits of Edel Trudis and Elisiaria. Emancipatory Narratives opens with the 1870 freedom suit, a lawsuit by which, by which the enslaved made legal claims to freedom, of Edel Trudis, the daughter of an African woman who came to be known as Teresa in Brazil. Teresa had probably arrived in Brazil as a captive during the era of what is known as the illegal phase of the transatlantic slave trade in Brazil in the 1830s and 40s, and had been trafficked into the diamond mining regions in the interior of Bahia in the northeast of Brazil. To a boom town, now called Musulji, at the centre of the discovery and then expansion of this highly profitable industry that attracted traders and agents from European commercial houses in London, Paris and Amsterdam. Like every other enslaved African and their descendants born into slavery in the Americas, Teresa did not want to live and die in captivity, and she wanted nothing less for her children either. But she had given birth to two children while enslaved, Edel Trudis and her older brother Benedicto, and as the status of the mother determined that of the child, they inherited her enslaved status. But sometime after Edel Trudis' birth in 1853, Teresa did manage to become freed, although I don't know how. Then, in 1857, she secured free status for her two children. But, in 1861, brother and sister were sold as slaves by the widow of their former owner, separating them from each other and their mother. By 1870, Edel Trudis was herself the mother of two children born into slavery, the second of which was born only months before the passing of the Free Womb Law in Brazil in 1871. Her freedom suit took six years to pass through the Imperial Brazilian judiciary. She lost, meaning Edel Trudis and her children remained enslaved. It's worth noting, though, that Benedicto also lodged a freedom suit, about which I only know the outcome, as I've not been able to trace the suit itself. It was, in contrast to his sisters, successful. Like Edel Trudis and her children, Elisiaria was also born into slavery in Brazil and in Bahia, but this time in the coffee-growing region of the, of the south of the province, known as Colonia, Colonia, excuse me, Colonia Leopoldina, a reference to the former government-sponsored immigration programme to attract European farmers from Germany and Switzerland. And the region is in this, in this square around Porto Seguro in, in the south of Bahia. Unlike Teresa, Elisa Yaria had never experienced freedom, but her desire for it became especially acute with the onset of her second pregnancy in 1875. This was some four years after the passing of the Free Womb Law, a somewhat misleading and disappointing, uh, misleading title and disappointing one for abolitionists, as it did not automatically free children born to enslaved mothers. Instead, it offered the chance for children of enslaved mothers, known as ingenios, to be freed before the age of seven through compensation to their owner, and it did offer the right of the enslaved to manumission through self-purchase. With this in mind, Elisiaria and the father of her children, a freed man himself, offered to buy Elisiaria's freedom, so their second child would be born free, rather than as an ingenio. The couple held occupational positions often regarded as privileged in the hierarchy of slavery in Brazil, if not the Americas. Cesario was an overseer and Elisiaria a household slave, 
and more calmer to be precise, means she was the personal servant of the mistress of the house and her daughters. And until she made serious attempts to be comforted, she was, in her former slave owner's words, held in high esteem by them. But when she and Cesario wanted to buy their freedom, which they were legally entitled to do after 1871, that narrative changed. According to Eliciaria slave owners, the pianist G. Carvalhos, and citing their own words used in her freedom suit, despite all the benefits given to her by my family, unquote, Eliciaria had obtained the funds to purchase her freedom fraudulently, thereby nullifying her claim to it. Conveniently, she was accused of multiple thefts of numerous items from the slave owning household, including from other slaves. Dis and despite being pregnant, she was beaten and kept in irons in a private prison on one of the coffee plantations, treatment which threatened the viability of her pregnancy. In collaboration with the local police chief, Cesario managed to free her, but it was a bloody affair involved in an armed invasion in which one enslaved man died of gunshot wounds. In her freedom suit of 1876, Eliciaria was described in racialized terms for light skin, skin colour, which are now considered pejorative and may well have been at the time by those they were used to describe. But like her occupation and her sex, her light skin colour has often been associated with bestowing advantages in slavery and in freedom. Although Eliciaria's slave owners disputed her legal right to manumission and defended their constitutional right to retain them in enslavement, by 1876 the law was clearly on Eliciaria's side and her freedom suit was successful. But Eliciaria and Cesario had already had to pay for the freedom of their first child. They also lost their home and positions. The financial costs for freed of freedom were substantial for the enslaved and their families, the emotional ones immeasurable. These are snippets of evidence from a range of primary sources used in the emancipatory narratives, and they are sources which are already known about and widely used by scholars in the field. So if for argument's sake we accept that there are only two kinds of history books, those that reveal something completely new about the past, and those that present new ways of thinking about the past we already know about, emancipatory narratives falls into the latter category. It is an intervention into debates about race and gender in general and the history of slavery in Brazil, and more specifically about how we speak to the history of manumission and miscegenation in Brazilian history and society. I will attempt in the rest of this talk to demonstrate firstly why that is important and necessary, and secondly explain how I went about, go, went about doing it. Brazil was one of the largest slave societies in the Americas. Around 40% of the 10 to 12 million Africans made captive in the transatlantic slave trade were disembarked in Brazil. It took, it took two acts of legislation to end the slave trade to Brazil in 1831 and 1850. And Brazil was the last nation in the Americas to abolish slavery in 1888. Emancipatory narratives is set within this time frame, also known as the imperial period in Brazilian history, and located in terms of place in the northeastern province of Bahia, and its capital, the Atlantic port city of Salvador de Bahia, the first and former colonial capital of Portuguese America, as well as one of the two major slave trading ports of the sugar producing northeastern region of Brazil. Slave produced cane sugar constituted the first major economic cycle of colonial Brazil. It was sugar that made the Portuguese colonial enterprise in Brazil so profitable for the Portuguese crown and made Brazil the main supplier of sugar on world markets for the best part of two centuries, the 16th and 17th. By the 19th century, it was coffee producing regions of Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais in the southeast that propelled the transatlantic slave trade to Brazil. The preeminence of Brazilian sugar having been lost to other colonial powers. Indeed, Brazilian coffee was one of the main slave-produced commodities behind what scholars now refer to as the era of second slavery, a phase of reconfiguration of imperialism and slavery in the Americas and Europe, the period post the Revolutionary Wars of the late 18th century, of the late 18th century US and IT, and the legal cessation of the transatlantic slave trade across Anglophone North America and the Caribbean after 1807, namely, after one of the major players in the transatlantic slave trade had formally abolished the trade of Britain. This was the same year that Britain provided the naval protection for the transfer of the Portuguese royal court to Brazil under the threat of a Napoleonic invasion, a condition of which was an agreement on the part of the Portuguese crown to commit to ending the slave trade, which did not come to pass legislatively until 1831, by which time Brazil had gained its independence from Portugal, again underwritten financially by British banks and negotiated diplomatically by the British government. As the 1831 law was never implemented, by 1849 the British government, in its role as self-appointed police of the high seas, had invaded Guanabara Bay and threatened to choke the export of slave-produced coffee through Rio de Janeiro. 
Consequently, the transatlantic slave trade was finally abolished in 1850. As we've seen, the next piece of anti-slavery legislation came some two decades later in 1881, so, excuse me, 1871, in the form of the Free Will Law. Another two more decades later, slavery was finally abolished in 1888, followed swiftly by the fall of the monarchy. Both the status of Brazil as the longest lasting slave society in the Americas and the prolonged role of Brazil in the transatlantic slave trade make Brazil stand out in the history of slavery in the Americas. There are, two other, there are other features of Brazilian slavery that have been regarded as distinctive too, namely manumission and miscegenation. While not unique to Brazil, these societal expressions of slavery were articulated differently, demographically and discursively, both in the era of slavery and beyond in Brazil, in comparison to other regions in the Americas, thus most notably to the US, the region to which Brazil has most frequently been compared in the study of slavery and race relations. In contrast to the US, there were no laws against manumission in Brazil, nor were there any anti-miscegenation or racial segregation laws pre- or post-abolition either. Hence, by the end of the 18th century, the fastest growing sector of the population of some of the oldest slaveholding regions in Brazil was free people of colour. The majority were, like Elisiaria, of mixed racial heritage, African, European and indigenous descent. Many were also sons and daughters of free parents, that is, formerly enslaved Africans or Brazilians, and had been born into freedom. A minority were formerly enslaved, manumitted Africans and Brazilians, like Teresa, Cesario and Benedicto. Estimates, and they are just estimates, indicate that around 1 to 2% of the enslaved in Brazil acquired their three freedom through manumission. As a major statesman and abolitionist insisted, even in the late 19th century, the freed were indeed exceptions in Brazil. In general, the majority of the freed were women and children, although the majority of the enslaved were male. In addition, the enslaved who were racialized as mixed race were overrepresented among the freed in relation to their number among the enslaved, but there were some important regional variations. In Salvador, estimates for 1835 indicate that around 7% of Africans were freed. In a city where free and free people of colour were, were, who were Brazilian represented almost a quarter of the population. And in general it's accepted that the size of the free population by implication, implication chances for manumission were greater in towns and cities than in rural areas. Both the comparative demographic prominence of free people of colour and greater opportunities for manumission in Brazil so gave rise to notions of slavery in Brazil as benign and race relations as harmonious, otherwise known as racial democracy. Thus, the historical narratives of race and gender emanating from manumission and miscegenation have been mobilised distinctively in Brazil, in both the popular imaginary and academic and scholarship. In the first half of the 20th century, the mixed race woman, otherwise known as the mulata, the term that was used to describe Elisi, or at least one of the terms that was used to describe Elisiado racially, became a marker of Brazilian cultural identity in literature, cinema, theatre, popular music, TV drama, advertising, tourism, everything. This elevation of miscegenation as a racial idea through the myth of racial democracy was from the 1930s onwards propagandised through the work of Gilberto Freire. In the mid-20th century, social sciences challenged the empirical validity and accuracy of claims about racial democracy in Brazil. Later, and especially after the end of military rule of the 1980s, sorry, Scholars began to critique the history of race and slavery and scrutinise the archive more closely. The documentary evidence historians uncovered discredited conclusively the notion of slavery in Brazil as benign. Historiographically, the mythical version of race and slavery in Brazil has been discredited. However, there remain what appeared to me at least the disjunction between how, on the one hand, historiographical debates about slavery had shifted towards more slave centred and revisionist approaches. While debates about the two key features of Brazilian slave society, manumission and miscegenation, struggle to shake off some of the more traditional modes of thinking about black female mobility. In particular, there remains an underlying tendency in manumission studies to attribute differential outcomes in manumission to slave owner preferences around race and gender, which makes sense if manumission is viewed solely as a form of slave owner control and without regard to imperatives for emancipation from the enslaved themselves. And what I mean by these different outcomes is sort of summarised here on, on this slide. So, for example, Africans were regarded as, as having been penalised by being more likely to have to pay for their manumission. Criolas, that's the term used for first generation uh, black Brazilian women with African parents, so not um, a mixed race background, were more likely to be freed conditionally because they were looked on more favourably by the slave owners. And similarly, mixed race women and children have been regarded as having the easiest route to manumission because they were the least likely to purchase it. It was evidence about the lives of women like Teresa Edontrudis and Elisiari that prompted me and then compelled me to seek out 
alternative approaches to my mission on miscegenation in three ways. To rethink narratives of women and children in my mission, and rather than just produce more evidence about sex experiences in my mission, which we have been plentiful, in emancipatory narratives, I reconceptualise my mission of women and children as a form of emancipatory activism, which by the 19th century shaped abolitionist praxis, thus awarding a political significance to their actions. I also wanted to rethink black female strategies for freedom through the lens of reproductive slavery, which hasn't been done to date. And that includes, but it's not limited to, reproductive violence, maternal dispossession and forced kinlessness, and thereby foregrounding and slave imperatives for emancipation through gender differentiated experience of an slavery. And as an extension of both points, I wanted to rethink black female socio economic behaviours in freedom through a comparative historical approach to key aspects of black women's lives, reproduction, accumulation, household formation, to better understand the implications of these experiences for these, uh, their own women's understandings of freedom and slavery. Into four parts, each with two chapters. <coughs> um, the parts are organised around the subject position of the enslaved mother and the reproduction of her children in enslavement. At times the study foregrounds the enslaved mother as historical subject, but at others it is her children that constitute the focus of historical analysis and interpretation. As we've seen, part one opens with a view of enslaved motherhood through the lens of the, of the mother's struggles for her own freedom and that of her children, both before and after the law released her from reproductive slavery. Using four freedom suits from 19th century by Eva's case studies, chapters one and two posit how a maternal imperative drove enslaved women's pursuit of freedom, African and Brazilian, black and mixed race, both pre and post the otherwise defining year of 1871. Additionally, across the two chapters, the analysis of freedom suits illustrates how local and national politics interface with women's claims for freedom in rural and urban locations, as well as from small and large slave holdings. Provincially, these cases are caught up in two major regional traditions, liberal revolt and the rule of land barons, which is the main in Portuguese colonialism. Historically, they are also linked to illegal slave trading, both pre and post-1850, international and domestic, and legislatively, they speak to changing jurisprudence on the rights of slave owners in the second half of the 19th century. Part two moves the historical narrative from the maternal imperatives to the causes and consequences of those imperatives, children in slavery and freedom. Chapter three reviews the literature and data on children in the slave trade to Brazil and slavery in Brazil, and in slavery in Brazil. But in the interest in time, I'm just going to cover the slave trade here because there's, there's, there's a consensus really about figures for uh, children in, in Brazil. When looking at global figures for the trade, the majority of Africans made captive were male and adult. But closer scrutiny of the slave trade databases has revealed more has, has revealed important variations, especially after 1807, that's the era of second slavery. In the first two decades after the British and US withdrawal from the trade and the transfer of the Royal Court to Brazil, Brazilian trade in enslaved Africans more than doubled. The number of African men made captive increased by 62% and women by 155%, while the numbers of African children trafficked increased by a staggering 203%. Although the number of African boys always exceeded, um, always exceeded that of African girls, according to two database experts, the most dramatic change to any category of Africans in the 19th century trade was, quote, the increase in girls. Thus, the role of reproductive slavery became critical to the trade under threat, and especially to Brazilian slavery. So, as we can see in this slide, that, uh, from data and evidence from the illegal period that focus of this book, the proportions of African children trafficked remained high throughout the illegal phase too. So, what we've moved from is a quite a low base layer that was sort of established about the late 18th century by. Uh, one particular database scholar, Herbert Klein, uh, that set it about 1 to 10 percent in terms of children. Um, and that became accepted sort of as a standard figure, but it was only when we got more information about the slave trade, it was quite recently, particularly about Brazil, that we realised there was a lot more children involved in the, in the 19th century. <clears throat> Given the wider geopolitical dyna uh, dynamic shape of Brazilian slavery, um, in part two of the book, uh, it reviews Brazil, Britain's role in anti-slavery trade politics in Brazil during sec the era of second slavery generally, and the illegal phase of the trade more specifically the 1830s and 40s. 
Chapter 3 presents analysis of discursive components of two key contemporary debates in 19th century British politics, which Seymour Drescher coined the two emancipations of child labour at home and slavery abroad, specifically the British Caribbean. These debates did not just run parallel in British politics, instead they competed for a similar semantic emancipatory terrain and proponents on both sides mined the same moral rhetorical scene of slavery and child labour in their attempts to gain political leverage, as we can see in these two images. One of the key campaigns of the child labour movement in the 1830s indeed was called Slavery in Yorkshire, and yet the object of diplomatic anti-slave trade politics the slave trade to Brazil, remained beyond the scope of British abolitionist activism and in an era when the levels of African children in the trade reached an all-time high. With the wider context of the de these debates in mind, historical comparison of child labour in 19th century England and Brazil highlights the following features. First, that child labour, as it was in the 19th at that time in the 19th century, free and slave societies were broadly similar in terms of tasks and time spent la labouring. Second, that the levels of infant and childhood mortality among the poor in both regions were similar at around 300 to 100,000, 100, sorry, 300 per 100,000, although we don't have equivalent data in both. However, family sizes were not, and free women in industrial urban towns and cities continued to reproduce large families, whereas enslaved and free women in Brazilian towns and cities did not. This confirms that W. Du Bois stated emphatically in the 1930s that, quote, no matter how degraded the factory hand, he is not real estate, unquote. Placed in the comparative context of 19th century labour regimes of non-elites, even if the arduousness of the labour was similar, the extent of personal, personal autonomy of free and enslaved labourers was not. And it is this distinction that helps unlock the imperatives of enslaved motherhood in manumission of their children, and particularly the prioritising of female children in order to bring a definitive end to the legacy of enslavement for subsequent generations. The second chapter in part two, two comprises qualitative and quantitative analysis and interpretation of a collection of 375 letters of liberty for over 400 children from the period 1830 to 1871, which leads to three main conclusions. Around three quarters of enslaved mothers remained enslaved when their children were freed, meaning that enslaved mothers prioritised their children's freedom over their own. Paternity itself was not found to be a causal factor, narratively or empirically, and the proportion of male slave owners and manumitters could not account for overrepresentation of children among the freed or any subset of freed children. Instead, female slave owners were overrepresented as manumitters of children, were more likely than their male counterparts to manumit enslaved children, and especially mixed race girls. In addition, claims about paternity were rare, exceptional even, I think I found two. Instead, a rhetoric of paternal surrogacy was more commonly found in the narratives of letters of liberty for children. And what I mean by that is that it was more common for female than male slave owners to uh, make or use, motivate, use made motivational language to the effect that having they were free in the child because, because they had raised them as if they were his, his son or daughter. But the aim here is to interrogate the notion of effective relations in childhood manumissions, not to sentimentalise them in accordance with the myth of racial democracy. Manumission of children is not read here as a benign or indeed benevolent act far from it. As this letter of liberty demonstrates, manumission was perceived by the slave owner as a gift to be given, but so too was the child, especially in conditional manumissions. As we see here in the name of love, charity, protection and free will, this one day old son of an African woman was handed over to two women who would benefit from a lifetime of his enslaved labour in return for his freedom at some point in the distant future. Yet, within the narrow context of data-driven manumission studies, this kind of manumission is often described as more advantageous or favourable than, for example, the paid route most Africans had to take. Closer scrutiny of childhood manumission suggests a case for challenging how we hierarchise the paid, conditional and so-called gratis routes to manumission in the way we have to date. And in this study, around 40% of childhood manumissions were granted without conditions or payments. We call them free. However, rather than regard this as an easier privi or privileged route to freedom, I read the large proportion of gratis manumissions for children as testament of enslaved women's ability to secure freedom for almost half of their children through the continued provision of their own enslaved labour in lieu of any payment or condition, as was the case with Cyprian, uh, the 
and the majority of mothers in childhood money missions research for the study. For the other half of their children, mothers either lived out conditions with them or funded their freedom individually or conjointly from their own free labour. These individual acts of emancipation, when taken collectively, produce a narrative of freedom in which the enslaved labour of mothers becomes determinant in the emancipation of thousands of children. In the words of Fabiola Glynn, quote, securing manumission, defending it as a freedom strategy, was indeed a form of critical labour, unquote. In part three, the themes of paternity, manumission and miscegenation considered in relation to enslaved motherhood in parts one and two are extended into black motherhood in freedom in Brazilian slave society. Across chapters five and six, these themes are interrogated through the lens of interracial relationships between a Portuguese immigrant man and two black Brazilian women, one born into slavery, Marcolina Gomez, and the other three, Ignacio Maria da Conceição. These two cases draw attention to the problematical and unresolved task of determining stable terms that describe these relationships. The inadequacy of language in Portuguese and English to capture the inequalities and injustices, racial and reproductive, inherent to these relationships is indicative of the ongoing ontological and existential crisis induced by reckoning with the history of slavery and the myth of racial democracy in Brazil. However, the words used in the two chapter titles crystallise the crises that prompted these women to enter into dispute with Alexandra Gomez Rodriguez. She was mistress of the house was a statement used as proof of her already acquired free status in Marcolina's defence in what was ultimately her successful freedom suit of 1857 58. The assertion associated Marcolina's position in Alexandra's household and his personal life with a feminised social uh, status and behavioural norms at odds with his claims to her as his property and his accusations of her sexual promiscuity. Alexandra not only denied Marcolina's right to free status, but the paternity of her two sons as well. But according to Marcolina, she had been in a relationship with Alexandra before he became her slave owner, and they had purchased her and her two sons because he intended to free them. We know that he freed one of them in baptism, as this slide shows, but he failed to keep his promise to Manny Marcolina and her other son. That is, until she won two contours in a lottery, probably in the early 1850s. According to Marcolina, she allowed Alexandra to collect and keep her winnings in return for her freedom and that of her second son. But despite repeated requests, Alexandra failed to issue a letter of liberty, without which Marcolina knew her free status was meaningless. Although the suit was relatively short, uh, lasting just over a year, Marcolina paid a high price for her free status, beyond the value of her lottery ticket. She endured, along with her young son, two bouts in prison the second one for over a year, more or less the duration of the, of the suite itself. The first didn't was shorter because she supposedly issued a declaration withdrawing her claims for freedom. The second was the result of her persistent attempts to obtain a letter of liberty from Alexandra, which resulted in a physical dispute between them. Marcolina, though, as enslaved property, could be imprisoned for acts of so-called disobedience. I must declare that this house is hers was the statement used by Alexandra in his last will and testament of 1874, where he acknowledged that one of the houses in his name had been paid for with Ignatius earnings, the mother of his daughter, uh, Maria Luisa, with whom he'd been in a relationship for the best part of a decade. He also recognised Maria Luisa as his daughter and named her as heir to his estate. He did this because he would have understood just how this combination of unmarried status and being propertyless posed a serious problem for women and children left behind. First, Ignatia had no legal right to anything held in Alexandra's name. Second, as Maria Luisa was still a minor, the state regarded her as an orphan, and as her mother was not a property owner, she would not be entitled to legal custody of her own daughter, or at least she had no chance of winning it. We know where mother stood is. Furthermore, Alexandra died in debt, something he would have known about at the time of writing his will. He surely understood the implications for his daughter. His estate, including the house paid for by Ignacia, had to be auctioned to pay off his debts. But more seriously, Maria Luisa was placed in care, in the care of the state, in, well, state appointed guardians, three in fact, the cost of which was also supposed to come out of Alexandra's estate. In fact, much of Alexandra's program record concerns Ignacia's attempts to challenge the costs and treatment of her daughter under the guardianship. She was right to be concerned. Tragically, Maria Luisa died, aged 16, supposedly in the care of one of them. Ignacia was left with nothing. And while Marcolina's winnings were sufficient to pay her way out of slavery, using them up 
and she began her life of reading with Robin too. Part four follows another guardianship case, this one disputed by an African free woman, Margarita de Madeiros. We know that Margarita was Nagor, so she would have had a Yoruba name originally, but Margarita de Madeiros was the name she went by in Bahia as a free woman. Like other Africans, she had purchased her freedom from her, her owner, a widow called Victoria de Amelas. As a free woman, Margarita continued to labour in much the same way she had when enslaved, working for Victoria in a home in the morning and in the street during the, uh, during the rest of the day. At some point, Margarita moved out of Victoria's home and attempted to set herself up in business, leaving her two children, both born free with Victoria. Once she had her own home and business set up, which included only slaves herself, she wanted her children to live with her. Victoria refused. She nominated a guardian for them instead. As already mentioned, guardianship laws were especially punitive to propertyless or married women. But as Margarita's legal representatives and sisters, she was a property owner and made a business out of trading goods, including from Africa. But evidence from other sources indicates she struggled in freedom, just as most free, free people did. Local census data reveals she moved home three times in the course of the freedom suit and didn't manage to keep her slaves either, presumably selling them to other respondents. Margarita's case is especially revealing of how discourses of fear of Africans pervaded the national imaginary in the wake of the end of the transatlantic slave trade in 1850 and a series of deadly yellow fever epidemics that were often attributed to the trade too. Above all though, Margarita was an Angol, the same ethnicity as the enslaved men who rose in rebellion in Salvador in 1835, bringing their battle to the streets of the city, the events of which are now the subject of this study by Joao Feige. It is not in the least surprising then that the case against Margarita re relied on the demonization of Africans, similar to the cases against those Africans tried in 1835. Indeed, Victoria had Margarita arrested on the basis that she was involved in African courts associated with suspected, uh, associated with suspected revolts. The police must have thought differently as she was never charged. All the same, the damage was done to Margarita's reputation as an African free woman. But the case against her went beyond that and exposed a fear of African motherhood more specifically. It was a fear that African mothers could not be trusted to raise Brazil's own citizens. A fear that children raised by African mothers would fashion an identity out of their ties to their African past, not their Brazilian future. As the title of the chapter indicates, and it's a quote from uh, Victoria's um, defence lawyers, Africans as non-citizens, even as free men and women, could not be trusted in this role, especially not my gods, who had a tradition of rebellion in 19th century by year. Put another way, this statement was not meant as a compliment, and it could be translated alternatively as they were thick as thieves. In addition, the evidence about the lives of Victoria and non Gionales and Margarita de Madeiras provide insights into each woman's respective socio-economic group. Victoria was a reasonably wealthy widow and sole mother of an illegitimate daughter, meaning the father of the child was a married man. In her will and testament, we learn that she was a property owner of three houses and eight slaves, and her daughter was the sole heir. With the findings of analysis of childhood money missions in mind, Victoria's will and testament also gives additional insights into female slave ownership and money mission. Like the majority of female slave owners, Victoria invested in enslaved women rather than men. As an investment strategy, it was social as well as economic, and provided for her daughter's financial security, domestic comfort, long after Victoria's death. Although not stated in the Will and Testament of 1857, I, expect, I suspect that Generosa, Domingos and Sebastião were the children of the enslaved women in Victoria's household. And thinking back to the results of analysis of childhood money missions, we see that Victoria freed a mother and daughter without conditions in payment, and there was a very small number of those. It's extremely rare. While the African woman paid, albeit a small amount, that, that was a, you know, a nominal fee really for her money mission, and Generosa was manumitted conditionally. In some findings from Margarita's bold but unsuccessful freedom suit suggests a need for greater secure, uh, scrutiny of the significance of the urban slave owner household as a vehicle of creolization directed at children of African. Furthermore, Margarita's exceptional case alerts, alerts us to the wider rule, namely the dangers of being a reproductively active African woman in 19th century by year. Although Margarita had given birth to her children in freedom, she found herself legally separated from them as if she'd been the bearer of an enslaved woman. 
Margarita's experience of the afterlife of reproductive slavery exposed the risk of motherhood and the precarity of food status for African women in 19th century Brazil more generally. The significance of her historic legal challenge is, therefore, far greater than the few historical details we know about her life. The uniqueness of her case, and it is the only one for an African woman I found for the best part of the 19th century in the archives, confirmed why other enslaved mothers pursued different strategies for freedom, including putting their children's freedom before their own, as have Cipriana and hundreds of others like her. Are we all right for time? Yeah? I've got two pages left. The final chapter in the book examines this point more closely through analysis of 88 wills and testaments of African and African descendant women freed and freeborn for the period 1830 to 1888. I examine a range of socio-economic behaviours including levels of nuptiality, maternity, household formation and modes of accumulation. This slide gives you an overview of some of the main findings of the research of these women's probate records. The main motivations being that African freed women had higher levels of marriage than women of African descent, whose level was much closer to that of the general population. The, the, probably less than well, a fifth or, or a quarter of the general population married, at very low levels of marriage. And among African women um, who usually married African men, it was much higher. Both groups had high levels of childlessness, though, especially never having had children rather than being childless at the end of life because all their children had predeceased them. Turning to the wealth of women who did leave wills and testaments, only a minority had no possessions to bequeath, and it, but it's worth mentioning that the value of the majority of the women's estates was less than the value of Marcolina's lottery ticket, two contours, and only a minority were as wealthy as Victoria Gionella's. But like Victoria, as slave owners, African African descendant women also invested in women, but unlike Victoria, only a minority could afford to invest in both real estate and estate property. Well, there's a lot of data analysis, uh, which I'm not particularly fond of myself, to be honest, but it's quite detailed, um, so I'm just going to summarise my main findings here. Africans who, owned Af uh, who were owned by Africans in Brazil sought their freedom too, and those that paid them for their freedom paid just as much as they would any slave owner. But those owned by white Brazilians had additional imperatives to escape captivity, as we've seen in Margarita Medeiros' uh, freedom suit. Indeed, Margarida and Cipriana's loss exposed the wide historical forces that propelled Africans to purchase their freedom. So flipping the logic of, of the conventional hierarchy of manumission then, the prevalence of paid manumission among Africans was, I regard, more as an enslaved preference than a slave owner penalty. Evidence from this and other studies indicates that Africans, to the Africans, and especially in Agor, preferred to buy their way out of slavery rather than settle for the compromise of conditional manumission. Consequently, the, through the approach of emancipatory narrative, self-purchase emerges as a mode of manumission regarded by some Africans as offering greater agency in their own emancipation. Conversely, when viewed through the lens of creolization, conditional manumission emerges as a mechanism of slave mastery, not a more favourable or easier route to freedom. For the more comparative perspective on domestic service in slave and former slave societies also cast doubt on the idea that Brazilian born women show somehow pursued conditional rather than paid manumission. On the contrary, having been raised within the slave owning household, Brazilian born women as children of African women were more likely to be subjected to social conditioning with a view to them becoming future citizens of the nation that had enslaved them, a status Africans could never attain. More importantly, the slave owner and the imperial Brazilian state shared the logic and goal that children of African women needed to be alienated from the traditions and beliefs of their African mothers and their kith and kin, and instead socialised as racially subordinate, but useful and loyal to the nation of their birth, Brazil. Summing up then, what, so what does the emancipatory narratives bring to the debate about manumission um, uh, and understanding about slavery in Brazil that is being all different? Firstly, I make a case for pivoting away from speaking to the prevalence of women and children in manumission through the lens of slave owner control generally, and slave owner paternity and effective relations with male slave owners more specifically. In, ad in addition, I eschew a racialized lexicon evidence in manumission studies which has, unwittingly or not, reproduced slaveocratic sentiments and the semantics of racial democracy by linking differential outcomes around race and sex to notions of ease, advantage, benefit and privilege of some groups of enslaved over others. Second, in emancipatory narratives, the gendered and racialised praxis 
the manumission of women and children is regarded as a response to the reality of reproductive violence in slavery in the pursuit of reproductive justice and freedom, rather than the relative benefits and advantages of females over males, children over adults, Brazilians over Africans, and light skin colour over blackness. Seen from this perspective, the demographic disproportionality of women and their children in manumission and freedom suits can be read as a refusal of reproductive slavery, acts of emancipatory activism that not only predated anti-slavery legislation and the abolitionist movement in Brazil, but which by the 19th century shaped anti-slavery sentiment and abolitionist praxis. Third, within the, within, within the approach of emancipatory narratives, it is argued that the primary historical imperative that informed enslaved women's strategies for freedom for themselves and their children was a maternal logic that was also female-centric, Prioritising the freedom of the enslaved to a female made sense if the aim was to rid subsequent generations of the condition of enslavement. Instead, in emancipatory narratives, I demonstrate how, rather than maleness and maternity, it was femaleness and maternity that increased a child's chances of freedom in three ways being a female child, having a female slave owner, and most importantly of all, the child to remain with her mother, who, was usually, who usually remained enslaved when she was freed. Where enslaved women as mothers were written into uh, the, the records of history, they often carried names that were not originally their own if they were African, or not their mother's choosing if they were of African descent. The similarity and commonality of their names, such as Teresa, Luisa, Felicidade, Rosa, European and Christian origin, have sub subsequently rendered these women difficult to distinguish from one another in the archive. Only when they became litigants, criminals, property owners, and testators did the lives of African and African descendant women come into historical view. And like the sketches of Thomas Ender that grace uh, the cover of this book, make their own, albeit fleeting, but forceful historical marks. In fact, this book is an attempt to make visible these women's names and lift their own emancipatory narratives out from that anonymity and that indistinguishability. In doing so, the life stories of African and African descendant women do not fit always or inevitably into neat, fit neatly into heroic histories of slave resistance or conform to celebratory triumph trajectories of revolutionary liberation. Rather, the terms of their own successful and unsuccessful attempts at freedom illustrate and presage the problematical terms of freedom for black women in post abolition Brazil. And for this very reason, their stories are crucial to the unravelling the labels of paradox and enigma that have plagued the history of slavery and race relations in